please join me in welcoming tonight Philippa Gregory. It's very odd when someone says you're an amazing human being, but thank you very much. <laughs> uh, okay, I'm really, really glad to be here. I really appreciate you coming out to see me and to meet me tonight. And I'm going to talk to you about my new book, Tidelands. And I'm going to start with an apology because I know there are very, very many of you. <laughs> well, I'm not doing it. Um, I know there are very, very many of you who uh, absolutely love the Tudor books and the Plantagenet books, and Tidelands is not one of them. <laughs> and I know there has been a degree of grief and resentment about that, and I apologise, but you can't always do the same thing. And I really wanted to move, period, and I really wanted to move particularly away from the royal courts. I didn't come to the Tudor and Plantagenet stories because what I wanted to do was to write about royals. What I wanted to do was to write about women. And the woman that I found that set me on this long course of these uh, fictional biographies was Mary Boleyn, the sister of Anne Boleyn. And when I came to her, I found her really by chance uh, when I was looking at um, some documents about the Tudor Navy. I literally found her by accident. And as soon as I discovered her story, I went, that's such a fascinating story of a woman who is, in a sense, unknown to history. There was no biography written of her at all. I found everything I found out about her in footnotes and in little documents, and actually one in a letter which had been kept by Thomas Cromwell. And those of you who uh, think Thomas Cromwell is a horrible man, it's true. He <laughs> He was a horrible man, but he had a very good filing system. <laughs> and for that, I'm very grateful, because it was that that made it possible that I could actually read the letter which Mary Boleyn had written. And that's such a rarity. It's an extraordinary thing to, to find. So I came to all of these women via Mary Boleyn, and her story led me uh, to the story of Catherine of Aragon, who I was interested in, not as Queen of England, but as this young Spanish princess who was brought to England and who married first Arthur, and then subsequently had to endure long years of very cruel treatment uh, at the royal court until she married Henry. And in a way, it was that story that I was interested in, not the subsequent story of her betrayal and uh, her abandonment. And her story led me to the story of her mother-in-law, who was the white princess, Elizabeth Woodville's daughter, Elizabeth, Princess of York. And in turn, her story led me to her mother, the woman that I probably love the most of anybody, uh, the white queen, Elizabeth Woodville. So these are all actually ordinary women in extraordinary circumstances. And what I was interested in first and foremost was the ordinary women. And because it's easier to find the stories of women in royal courts, and because one woman led me to another, I was continually returning to the royal family and the royal courts. And I, there came a point where I went, actually, I, I, I don't want to write about royal women anymore. <laughs> And one of the powerful reasons for that is because every time I go on book tour, somebody says to me, what do you think of Catherine Middleton? And <laughs> increasingly, I was replying, I try not to think about her at all, <laughs> which doesn't play very well. Um, I am by nature uh, an anti-monarchist. I'm not very interested in uh, an elite royal family. And uh, you, of course, have every right to feel different but it's not your taxes, because <laughs> you made sure of that. So... <laughs> so really, I too would enjoy them if they weren't costing me any money, but they are. <laughs> so I was very, very glad. What I wanted to do was to move to a different period and, and actually to focus on ordinary women, genuinely ordinary women. And that led me to, first of all, a landscape that I knew and loved very much, which I knew would be the setting for this new series, and then led me to create a character who has been my companion and best friend and a constant partner with me everywhere I go for the last two years. And she's called Eleanor, and you will meet her inside the cover of Tidelands. 
I set her in a landscape which is very familiar to me. When I was a young student at the University of Sussex, I lived on the Sussex coast in an area of marshland. And uh, during my summer vacations, I uh, used to be uh, the laziest, uh, most incompetent uh, conservationist worker, probably in the UK. <laughs> because my job was to guard a colony of birds who are called little terns. You probably, you're probably crawling all over with little terns, but they're very rare in England. And we had a colony in this nature reserve of 20 breeding pairs. And they breed on a stony island, and they lay eggs that look exactly like pebbles without going to the trouble or distraction of building a nest. <laughs> so basically, you have a, a shingle beach, and then you have eggs that look exactly like the shingle beach. <laughs> and you have these incredibly incompetent rare birds that when anybody comes near, flies up in the air, so you can't tell where the eggs are anyway. And so it was my job to sit beside this little island and say to anybody walking towards them, I'm very, very sorry, although it looks like nothing, this is actually a breeding colony of little terns. Would you mind not stepping on the eggs? And they would say to me, where are the eggs? And I would say, hell no. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> They're there somewhere. Um, at which point everybody very, very sweetly and very politely would go away and I would sit there until the tide rose, created it into an island again, and I was off duty for another, you know, 12 hours. It was, I was the laziest, um, <laughs> easy, easily employed security guard that there ever has been, but there are still breeding terns in, on the colony, so I didn't mess it up. And what I thought I was doing was almost nothing. Um, and what I found, this was years ago, this was 40 years ago, but what I found when I came to write a setting for this story was that those days and days and days and days sitting on the harbour watching the tide rise and fall had somehow entered into my imagination and entered into my memory. And when I came to write a landscape for this woman, it came to me as if it was... Honestly, as if I'd lived there all my life, it just flowed out of me. I had an immense instinctive appreciation of this landscape, which at the time I thought was, if anything, rather dull, and I now think is fantastically beautiful. It, that's just age. <laughs> it's, <laughs> it's like gardening. You start seeing, thinking things are nice that before you really just didn't notice at all. You just walk <laughs> through them. So uh, I also wanted to write about... I really also wanted to write about a family who were living in an environment that was very muddy. And there's a good reason for this. The medieval period was astoundingly muddy in England. This is actually before we start drainage schemes, so it genuinely was muddier than it is today. And also, one of the things that was distracting about writing about uh, royal and elite people is that everybody who comes up, and I'm sure there will be one or two of you in this evening, they come up to the signing table and they say, do you know I am descended from Anne Boleyn? And I go, no, how interesting, because it is interesting, and very often people are, because Anne Boleyn, you know, although she died tragically young and left only Elizabeth, which makes it a bit difficult to see how exactly they're descended from her, she was... <laughs> <laughs> I, I am not kidding, someone came up to me and said, I'm de descended from Elizabeth I, and I said, oh really, that's quite surprising, are you sure? And she said, yes, 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 Elizabeth I, the Virgin Queen, and I... <laughs> But most of us are descended from people working in agriculture. Most of us are descended from humble people. Most of us are descended from people who were farming, because if you go back far enough, there wasn't any industry for us to be descended from people doing. So I have a cousin who traced my family tree back, and we end up with in a muddy field, basically. <laughs> As both, so that was why I really wanted to set this novel in, uh, in a fairly primitive, fairly waterlogged environment, because that is the common experience of most of us. And I'd like to read you just a little bit about it. Oh, yeah, I will. <laughs> yes, I will. At the low wall of rough stone flints at the edge of the graveyard, she hitched up her brown skirt and hemp apron and swung her legs over the stile as lithe as a boy. He climbed after her and found himself on the shore, 
on the little path no wider than a sheep track, with quick thorn hedges closing in on both sides and meeting over the top, so that the two of them were hidden in a tunnel of thick leaves and twisted spiky boughs. Walking ahead of him, she bent her head and wrapped her elbows in her shawl, striding out in her wooden patterns, following the erratic course of the narrow path. The sound of the sea grew a little louder as she scrambled down a bank, and then they were suddenly in the open, lit by the fitful moon in the pale sky on a beach of white shingle. Behind them, the bank was topped by a big oak tree, its roots snaking through the mud, its down-swinging branches bending low to the beach. Ahead of them was the marsh, standing water, sandbanks, tidal pools, mud, reed islands and a wide winding channel of water with branching silted streams swelling and lapping over the mud, flowing in little waves that broke at their feet. Thalmire, she announced. I thought you said it was called Wandering Haven. That's what they call it in Chichester because it wanders. They never know where the islands are. They never know where the reefs are. The rivers change their beds at every storm. But we, who live on it and know all its changes, who change our paths in obedience to its moods, who hate it as a hard taskmaster, call it foul mire. For the birds, fowls, mire, bird marsh. For the mud, foul, she said. If you misstep, it holds you till the sea comes in for you and you are foully drowned. If you get free, you stink like a foul thing for the rest of your life. Have you always lived here? He asked, wondering at the bitterness in her voice. Oh yes, she said. I am mired. I am bound as a tenant to a neglectful lord and I cannot leave. I am wife to a vanished man and cannot marry. And I am sister to the ferryman and he will never carry me across to the mainland or set me free. She's very much a woman of her times because this is a period where women had no legal position in the world. They had no rights whatsoever. Uh, their husband owned them as he owned his property. If they ran away from him, they lost their children automatically. Um, but they really couldn't run away because you couldn't run away to anywhere. You had to belong to the parish where you were born unless you found work and were allowed to, to, to join another parish. She's a woman like the land. The land is marginal land. Sometimes it's sea, sometimes it's land. And as I was writing it, I found that the landscape became almost another character in it and very, a very strong metaphor for this life that she was living on the edge of society as a poor woman, as a woman who had been deserted by her husband, as a woman who was trying to work as a herbalist and a midwife in a craft which was increasingly being squeezed out of the, of society by the physicians, the male physicians, who wanted to become obstetricians and gynaecologists and, and work with wealthy patients and leave the poor women to the village midwives. And they accused the village midwives of witchcraft or meddling or incompetence in order to increase their own status. So in almost every way she's marginal. The whole country is in a sense divided because this is the time of the English Civil War. I always say English Civil War to American audiences because I know there is a degree of confusion in your minds <laughs> about civil wars. And I have to say, you had a very, very good one. <laughs> but we had ours first. <laughs> and we beheaded the king, which is, you know, a pretty serious civil war to have. So this is a woman who is absolutely on the edge of almost everything you can imagine. And one night she's in the graveyard at midnight on Midsummer's Eve, hoping to see the ghost of her husband, her husband who has deserted her. Not because she wants to honor and love him, but because if she sees his ghost, then she knows that he's died in the previous year and she can consider herself a widow, which is about the only way to be a successful woman in the 17th century England. But instead of her ghost of her husband, she meets an extraordinarily attractive young man who himself is on the edge of society because he's a royalist spy and a Roman Catholic priest. And he asks her about her life. <laughs> Sorry, did I miss something? <laughs> okay. Oh, just a little sort of, ooh, that sounds good. <laughs> so he says to her, do you have children? 
She opened the heavy door of the porch, looked out to see that the graveyard was deserted, and then beckoned him to follow her. They walked in single file between graves where the stones were so thick with old moss and lichen that only a few letters could be seen. Two still living, she said over her shoulder. I thank God for them. My daughter is 13 and my son is 12. And does your boy fish in his father's place? The boat's missing too, she said, as if that were the greatest loss. So we can only fish with a line from the shore. Our Lord called a fisherman before he called anyone else, he said gently. Yes, she said, but at least he left the boat. <laughs> the reason that she is in such terror of poverty, uh, apart from the fact that she has two children to raise and provide for and she has no really guaranteed means of, of living, is because this is at a time, and all the way around Europe, where, in a sense, the hearts of the community were hardening against each other. The Elizabethan poor laws had changed the tradition of charity. So in, say, the 1400s, if you were a poor woman, you could go to the gate of the great lord and you could say to him, I am starving, and you could hope that he might take you either into his kitchen or into his great hall where the household all ate together and you could be fed for charity and he would probably give you work to do. This became more and more unmanageable, partly as a result of the changes in society and warfare and also the increasing prosperity of the lords. So they stopped, they stopped they closed their great halls. They didn't want their household eating with them. They privatised their lives. And you can actually see this in the architecture of the houses that are built at the time. What it meant was that poor people increasingly could not go to their neighbours and ask them for food. And the Elizabethan poor laws came in and said that every parish must have a local tax, that all the lords and the gentry of the parish must pay to the parish overseer, and that he would distribute the charity formally and officially, but only to the people that he wanted to distribute it to. And of course, since he was in the employ of the taxpayers, they were pretty clear to him that anybody who could possibly be moved out of the parish elsewhere, that should happen. So you have an increasing conflict between the wealthy people and the poor people in 17th century England. And that frames itself in lots of different ways. So it frames itself in a civil war where the poor people are basically saying we have a right to the land. But it frames itself also particularly against women because there is an increasing suspicion of women who after all are the ones who produce babies and therefore mouths to feed and also often who survive. So there, are, there is a disproportionate number in every community of older women who cannot earn a living anymore and fall on the parish and have every right to the support of the parish. And I'd like to read you a, a tiny piece about it. Uh, this is Alice goes to, Eleanor goes to uh, market and uh, tries to buy lace from uh, an old lady. My dear, all that stands between me and the parish is a yard of lace, the woman confided. You're too beautiful to know what it is to be a poor woman and a burden on your neighbours, but within a week of me selling nothing, they won't open their doors to me for fear that I'll beg a loaf of bread or a quart of milk, though they have a whole herd of cows. Within a month, they're wondering if they can move me on to another parish. They ask after my children and why I don't go and visit them. They hope to force me to be a burden on them. It's a bitter thing to grow old and poor. Pray that God spares you. One of the reasons why I was so pleased to write about this much more realistic, much more ordinary context is because it gives me the chance to talk about the lives of ordinary women and the range of ordinary women's lives. So one of the things that happens as this suspicion falls on older women and falls on women generally is that there's a growing suspicion that women are involved in witchcraft. And this is part of the demonising of women and it's part of the way that uh, there is an attack upon older women, but there's also an attack upon women generally if they're regarded as unruly or disobedient. So in previous years, that's quite explicit. So we have things in English society like scolds bridles and ducking stools. But as the anxiety about witchcraft grows and develops right across Europe, uh, England actually is less 
troubled by it than, than the rest of Europe. But as it grows more and more intense, then a single woman, especially a woman like Eleanor, who has uh, inexplicable moments of luck and prosperity, which her neighbours can't explain but find very, very suspicious, largely because she's involved now in a royalist plot, that they turn on her and her life becomes more and more dangerous. It doesn't help that as a midwife and a herbalist, she's been working for years and her mother before her was working for years on the health of the community. So while she has saved a number of people, medieval medicine being what it is, a lot of people have died in her care as well. And the biggest problem for her is that her runaway husband hates her and speaks badly of her. He even speaks badly of her to the man who loves her and who meets him when he's trying to hire a boatman to rescue Charles I from the Isle of Wight. Would you ever come back? James asked him. Never. Never. I'd rather die than go back to her. I'd rather drown. She's a whore, I tell you. A whore to fairy folk. She's a witch, I tell you. She can make a child without a man. She can prevent a child despite a man. She can kill a child in the womb and blast a man with icy breath. Dear God, what are you saying? James could no longer hide his fear at the man's words. The worst things a man could hear. A woman that could shrink his potency, kill his children. I know her. This isn't possible for a woman like her. It isn't possible for any mortal woman. You can say that, priest, the man said, his, wife, his voice low. You can say that who has never seen her naked, who has never touched her warm skin, who has never longed for her. But the taste of her mouth is like drinking henbane. She makes you thirsty for more and more, and then she drives you mad. I'm no priest, James said quickly, ignoring what Eleanor's husband said about the woman he loved. Zachary's lip curled. As you wish he said coldly, but something stinks of incense here and it's not me. Anyway, James said, trying to recover his authority, trying to banish the image of Eleanor whoring to a fairy lord. I've no time for this nonsense. I'm offering you a voyage or a rest, which will it be? Twenty crowns to take the trade out to a meeting of your saying, twenty crowns to bring you back. Yes, James said, and we never speak of this again, and you take my son back to her and tell her that you never saw me. I can't make him lie, but I can make up some excuse so that she does not look for me. She would not come looking for you. She has the sight, fool. She can see me if she pleases unless there is the deep sea between us. She can see me through deep water, I know that. She's afraid of deep water because she has no power over it. But if ever I sail into tidelands again, the mire will boil beneath my keel and throw me up like sea rack before her door, and she will destroy me with one look. So that's tidelands. <laughs> Thank you. Now, I'm at a complete loss here. I've been on book tour and I left my watch somewhere on the security belt, uh, which means that I don't know what the time is. And somebody was going to wave me a sign to tell me that it was 15 minutes. Oh, there you are. We have 30 minutes for Q&A. So thank you. If you can ask me anything you like, or if you like, before we start, we can play a game. <laughs> I know, I wish it was a drinking game. <laughs> I'm from England, that's our favorite game. But, We'll play a little game. You can pick. You can just shout out. Well, you have to put your hand up first so you don't all shout at once. A uh, number. Uh, and I have so much faith in this novel that I will read from the number of the page that you pick. It won't be a reading I've prepared. I believe that it's a book that you can read any page at random. So, but, so you don't spoil it for yourselves. You can't go to the end. So you can, <laughs> you can have any number between one and 400. <laughs> yes, ma'am. 282. Uh, uh, I did this in England before I came here, and a very charming young man picked, I think, 77, and I opened it, and it's an extremely erotic love scene. <laughs> and so I read the sort of the start of it, the sort of the lovely bit at the beginning, and then I stopped, and I said, OK. And I said, and the next number, and somebody said, 78. <laughs> I 
decided what to do. Eleanor drew a breath and told her daughter. It came to me yesterday, almost like a vision, Alice. When I delivered Lisa Auster's baby, I held her in my arms. She was no bigger than a kitten, and I saw how precious she was, such a miracle. Everything about her was perfect. She was a tiny person, her little eyelashes and her nails as small as the smallest shells on Wittering Beach, and her eyes were dark blue, like yours were when you were born. I could see the light of the world in her. I can't destroy such a perfect thing, Alice. It would be like breaking a blackbird's egg. I understand what is sacred for the first time in my life. This baby has come to me when I thought I would never have another, and I won't kill it. <laughs> I'll take one more. 397. 397. <laughs> yeah, just in the hopes. <laughs> I can't. Not because it's filthy, but because, <laughs> because it's a spoiler. It's a really, really shocking spoiler, so I can't. Yes. Page one. Oh, page one. OK. You're a methodical man. Start at the beginning. <laughs> you can buy a copy and read it later. <laughs> The church was grey against a paler grey sky, the bell tower dark against the darker clouds. The young woman could hear the faint stir of the shingle as the tide came in, whispering across the mud flats, recoiling from the beach with a little hiss. It was the height of summer, the eve of midsummer, the apex of the year, and though the night was warm, she felt chilled, for she had come to meet a ghost. This was the walking night for the dead this night and their saints' days, but she did not think that her drunken, violent husband had been under the care of any particular saint. She could not imagine angelic eyes on his erratic progress from sea to alehouse and back again. She did not know if he was run away or dead or pressed as a sailor in the disloyal fleet that had turned on their king and now sailed under the rebel flag for Parliament. If she were to see him, she would know he was dead for sure, and she could declare herself a widow and think herself free. She had no doubt that if he had drowned, his ghost would be coming, dripping water through the, through the misty graveyard on the white night of midsummer, when the sallow gleam from the west showed the sun refusing to sink. Everything was out of its place and time on this full moon midsummer eve, the sun unset, the throne upset, the world overset, a king imprisoned, rebels in power, and a pale moon white as a skull amid grey flying banners of clouds. Thank you. Thank you. I'd just like to say one thing about the, the start of it there. Some time ago, uh, I was talking to a psychotherapist and she explained to me uh, something of the theory of Gestalt, that it's, in a sense, everything that you need to know in one picture. And I decided that I wanted, in so far as I could, to have the first pages of my novels to be a sort of Gestalt picture of what was to come. And in that page, I'm glad you asked me to read it, actually. I don't read it, and it's a good page. I'll, I'll read it tomorrow. <laughs> Um, there is, in a sense, there's everything in there. There's her witchcraft, there's her sense of the other world, there is the presence of the other world, there's the landscape, and there's this sense of an enormously troubled and difficult personal life in the context of a country which is itself completely overturned. So I, I like that first page. Thank you. Uh, okay, I'll take questions or answers. Or anybody, there are microphones. So if you put your hand up, a microphone will come to you. And... Uh, here we are, one over here. <laughs> what inspired you to write about history? I'm a history major and I loved it, so what brought you to that? Um, I wrote my first novel, Wideacre, which some of you may have read, um, after a feverish four years of writing my PhD thesis. 
So I was a historian at uh, the University of Edinburgh, and I was writing, as it happens, um, a PhD thesis about 18th century novels. So I read 200 18th century novels, one after another. <laughs> and these are not, I'm glad you say that, because yeah, <laughs> it, wasn't a, it wasn't an easy road to hoe. These are not little books, they are like eight volume books. I mean, they include things like Clarissa, which goes on forever. Um, so by the time I'd finished it, not only did I have a very good idea about what the 18th century reader liked to read, which was what the thesis was supposed to be about, but I'd also served, as it were, a, a sort of unconscious apprenticeship in how a novel is put together. I'd just read flat out all of the important novels at the time that the novel was being invented. So also what I had established was a habit of writing every day because for my PhD it was 150,000 words which is about as long as a novel so every day I was writing some part of it or rewriting it uh, and so when I finally passed and had a PhD but had no job um, I, I just carried on with this sort of habit of writing every day and I wrote my first novel Wideacre which was set in the 18th century in the period that I had studied and was very much about the concerns of the 18th century about women's uh, lack of ownership of the land and the uh, unease between the working people and, and the enclosing landlords. So yeah, I mean if you like history it's, it seems to me to be the ideal source for fictional material. Somebody else? Yeah, lady there. Does somebody else want to put their hand up on the next microphone, go to them? There you go. Give you all something to do. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes. I recognize that Kaiden probably is your baby of sorts. You know, this is the novel that you wanted to write about. Is there another idea very vaguely that you have that's somewhat outlandish from what you were more popularly known for that you wanted to write about? And if so, what would that be? Okay, that's interesting. I've got a number of projects on at the moment. I'll walk away from that because I'm going to scream at you. Um, <laughs> Uh, I'm writing a film script, uh, which is my own adaptation of my own novel, uh, The Taming of the Queen. Thank you. <laughs> That's great. It's lovely. I'm very, very excited about it. The downside is, is, is it's going to cost about £20 million to make. So if any of you are film developers <laughs> and you have that money, that would be great. But uh, so I've been working on a script which has been fascinating. Um, I've been working on, uh, I've got a children's book, a children's book series, uh, which used to be called Princess Florizella, but I've rewritten it for a new generation, uh, and that'll be coming out. And um, most off plan, uh, I'm writing a, a history book, uh, non-fiction, and it's going to be called, it's the working title, is A Brief History. It's not going to be brief, it's going to go on for hours. <laughs> A brief history of normal women. So, and they're not going to be normal either, of course. So it's a kind of, uh, but it's 1066 to 1966. So it's nine centuries of English history, women in English history. And I am adoring it. It's just heaven to write. <laughs> okay, thank you. So that's coming. And one of the things that it, in a sense, is oppositional to is, uh, I mean, I think it, they're very helpful in some ways, but they really irritate me in other ways. It's this idea when people write 10, 10 women scientists, and you go like, there are 10. Are you kidding me? There are hundreds. There are thousands. Like, when you say 10, people go like, oh, we've got 10. You know, which is nice. Yeah, we've got 10. But, you know, actually, that doesn't begin to describe it. So this is about centuries of women's contribution to English history and I'm just finding the most extraordinary and wonderful women as I write it you know women um, women who run furnaces women who send out ships women who are massive entrepreneurial money lenders women who run massive massive flour mills or get into the brewing industry really young I mean women who are doing everything that men do but backwards in high heels you know the joke <laughs> thank you um, there was somebody over here yeah First of all, I'm honored to be in your presence and getting this energy from you. Thank you. I was wondering if uh, you could uh, share with us, uh, for aspiring writers, any tips you wish someone like you would have told you mm. in the past 
And also, uh, how do you find that confidence as a writer to continue down that path? Thank you, yeah. thank you. I understand exactly. Um, I suppose one of the things that I've learned over the time is that when I'm doing research, if there's something that, like, just in English, in England, I'd say tickles my fancy. I don't know if that's the sort of thing you say over here. If, if there's something that just, you know, it's like an earworm, if it's something just, if you go like, ooh, you know, make a note of it and write down where you saw it because that's the thing that will stay with you and then it'll drive you mad because you won't have noted where it was because it wasn't relevant at the time. It's that when you're doing research, don't just research what, what is in the book, research what's in you. So it, in a sense, you're always in a dialogue with your material. So the stuff that, that, that strikes a chord is the stuff that's really important to you. Anybody can do research. Anybody can pick up a book and read it. But what you want to know is what you get from that book when you read it. So that's really, really important. The other thing is like read, read just fanatically. Just read all the time. Don't do anything else. I mean, <laughs> certainly don't waste your time watching television or, or messing about on Facebook. You know, just don't do that stuff. You've got no time for it because you have got to be reading three or four hours every day. Uh, and then as you get the confidence, and the confidence will come when you get your voice, and you get your voice by reading loads and loads and loads of other things, and then when you come to write to yourself, one day, I promise you, you will put words on the page and they will ring true for you in a really quite unconscious way, but that will be your voice. And then all you do is go on writing and writing and writing. Again, no time for Facebook or tweeting or any of that sort of stuff. No time for that because now you've got to be writing four hours a day. So uh, it's demanding. And I suppose the other thing that nobody said to me at the time was like I wrote off my kitchen table while I was um, raising my daughter and making a living from uh, journalism. Um, and that is that you can do it. You can get four hours in the day to write. You can get time to write. But you have to really be quite dedicated to it. It's not easy. <laughs> Hope that helps. Thank you. Uh, uh, thank you. <laughs> One over here. Hi, Ms. Gregory. Uh, your depiction of Richard III is quite different from, say, Shakespeare's. So for years yes. I've been wondering, what got you interested or started in taking on the Richard legacy? Um, I, I just researched Richard III. I mean, Shakespeare's, Shakespeare's Richard III is absolutely dictated by Shakespeare's desire to curry favour with the new occupants of the throne and the new patrons, so the Tudors. So, in a sense, you can discard everything that Shakespeare says about <laughs> Richard III uh, to start off with. Uh, as soon as I read anything about Richard III, you know what, you can't help but get this impression of this really very, very engaging uh, when he starts his first battle. He he's in his first battle at something like 12 years old. I mean, immensely courageous. A trained professional soldier with total loyalty to his older brother that he adored. And I cannot put that picture with somebody who would kill his nephews, his brother's sons, in the tower in an underhand sort of way when he was, in any case, uh, now King of England and widely accepted throughout England. It just, it, there's no sense to it. There's no military sense to it, which I think he's very capable of. And there's no political sense to it. And he was also an outstanding politician. Um, so I, I liked him. I mean, I just simply liked him. And then when I realized that he had a warm working relationship with Elizabeth Woodville after the disappearance of her sons, you have to then say, so this woman whose two boys have been taken by this man and killed, then puts her daughters into his keeping. H how can that be? And the reason that we think it's reasonable is because we have <coughs> generations, we have centuries of scholars, almost all male traditional scholars, saying it's because she's crazy. <laughs> you know, which is a popular explanation for when women do something that men don't understand. <laughs> so I understand that, but in, on this instance, it leaves you with this complete conundrum, which is like, why would any sensible woman, and she's clearly a sensible woman because we see her other acts, why would any sensible woman trust a murderer with her daughters? 
when she believes he's killed her sons. Therefore, she can't believe that he killed them. Therefore, if she, the mother, didn't believe that he killed them, she must have thought someone else did. Who would that be? Possibly the man in France where her son is with, in support, and she calls him home. That's Henry Tudor. She calls her son home after the death of the princes. So I think, I think it was a Tudor act. And uh, there's a lot of research going on about it now, and more and more people are thinking it's probably a Tudor act. But it's one of the great mysteries of English history. <coughs> Thank you. Yes, lady here. Oh, you got a lady? Anybody got anybody? Yeah. Um, I, I, when, it's a non, when it's a fictional biography, I'm absolutely locked into the historical development, so I've got a biography, I can't do anything else with it. But when it's a fiction like this, it's very much freer. So I knew where we were going to end, and I was very, very intensely aware of the beginning, and I had an idea of the characters, but I really didn't know where they were going to take me. But then, uh, in the very early in the process, I realised that only a, year, only a year apart, a year later, Charles I was imprisoned on the Isle of Wight, which is a half a day's sail from where I had already set my novel. And I went like, wow, how lucky that is. <laughs> how enjoyable that is for me. I will just move the whole novel by a year, which makes no difference because these are people who are not historically recorded. They don't have a birth date, I have to observe. I moved the whole novel by a year, and now I've got the imprisoned king literally within sailing distance of my heroine who is in this muddy harbour facing the Isle of Wight. So that, in a sense, immediately meant that the whole novel went up a notch, and it took me into the bigger political story, which I knew I wanted to deal with, but I didn't know how I would get to. But then there it was, literally on my fictional doorstep. It was just lovely. It's lovely when that happens. There's a lady here. Um, audiobooks, they, they do a very helpful production process with me that they uh, ask me if I like the actors, they run them past me. I quite often uh, am part of the audition process when an audition process happens. But uh, I don't listen to them very much myself, uh, and there's a very, very good reason for that. There is something about the rhythm of my narrational voice which is so like the rhythm of my dreaming thoughts, my brain, that almost as soon as I hear somebody reading it, I fall asleep. <laughs> <laughs> now, this is very soothing, but it's not good practice in a car. So, <laughs> so when a lot of people listen to audiobooks, I can't listen to my own audiobooks in the car. I do listen to other people's audiobooks. But yeah, I mean, I, th for me, I, I, I'm, a, I'm a big person. I love words on the page. You know, like my early experience of books was awe, me reading to myself. And of course, my experience of writing books, I don't dictate, I write onto the page. So I'm very much uh, a sort of book, uh, paper book, or a, an e-reader e book reader. Um, but I know that people love audiobooks, and I know how well beloved the readers of my audiobooks are. So thank you. One over here. And if someone else puts a hand up, a mic can go and find them here. Yeah. Um, I'm curious, in your, in your leisure time, if you have, what authors do you enjoy reading? Um, well, I'm always slightly embarrassed by this because I sound so incredibly boring. Um, so at the moment, I'm reading two books simultaneously, um, and one is on the Lazarettos of Venice. Yes, really. The plague houses of, of uh, 17th century Venice. And the other one is on the Opium Wars of China. And the reason for that is that book two, the one that comes after Tidelands, uh, one of them is set almost half of the time in Venice. And book three, my family is going to move on to China. So I'm kind of thinking about it and dreaming about it now. So I almost always read for research. When I read fiction, I almost always read the English classics. 
So again, I sound immensely boring, but I read Jane Austen and I read Henry James and I love Edith Wharton. And I read m mostly uh, traditional um, classical novels. But it's very, the other thing is, is that I can't read historical fiction because if I read something and it does that process I was describing earlier where something like niggles me or I take a fancy to, a, to a something in it and it's someone else's fiction, then I'm really, really stuck because I might not remember that. I might remember the thing but not remember where I read it. So I really don't read historical fiction at all. Thank you. There was someone? So in your yeah. course, I was trying to find women that maybe are not known historically. Have you found anybody specifically that really like stood out that maybe if you're not going to write about what should be known in history potentially is not that a sentence? Yeah. <laughs> That's a very good title for the novel. It should just say Giant Badasses of English History. <laughs> yeah. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Uh, yeah, no, I mean, the frustrating thing is that uh, because women's history is so recent, so in England we haven't really been writing it, uh, it's, it's only been about 50 years of study. So there aren't a great number of scholars working on the enormous amount of documents that we have. And an awful lot of the documents that we have have been written from the viewpoint that women are women who speak up are wrong. So there's a tremendous, you know, there are just, there are just, I can't tell you, there are millions of women's stories sitting in the archive waiting to be discovered. And if you want to be a historian and do that, I recommend you get cracking. Because really, <laughs> there's, there's some wonderful work to do. There's a lot of work to do. Yeah, I mean, the, the most extraordinary stories of courage and, you know, intrigue and difficulty, and it's just all there. It's just all there waiting to be written up. Yeah. I, here. I, could somebody wave me the time. How are we off the time? 7.52. Thank you. <laughs> well, so we've got time for two more questions, I would think. Yes. Hi. Um, so as I read all your books, I feel like, unfortunately, a lot of these ideas about women um, prevail in the current day. And so since you have the luxury of writing about a fictional character in this one, I was curious if current events or things happening in your own life influenced um, your characters in the stories you wrote. Very much so. I think that every novel, if you pick up any historical fiction, you read immediately, you will see immediately two quite distinct periods. The one where it's set, and I give you a clue to that by putting the date at the top of the page, so like, we know that's where it is. But the, it, it, no author comes into the study and sits down and leaves their, their brain outside. You have to take it with you to write the novel. And of course, every day, for the last two years, I've been conscious of movements for women's uh, greater emancipation, for, for fairer treatment of women, for women to be free of abuse. And at the same time as I'm writing this nonfiction, how powerful it is to me, how little we have progressed in terms of women's safety in the workplace, in the home, and on the streets. It's uh, you know, I don't speak for your country, but for mine, it, it's appalling how little progress we've made. For instance, uh, Elizabethan England, of course, not many people were arrested for rape. Um, of course, not many women reported rape because you couldn't really report the misdoing of someone who was your superior. But Elizabethan England, in Elizabethan Sussex and Surrey, which is two southern counties, of the rapes that got to court, and you can imagine how few that was compared to the numbers that occurred, they had a 34% success rate of conviction. England today, we have a 34% success rate of conviction. We have gone precisely nowhere in centuries. And, you know, I, I can't... One of the things about writing history is, is you... You, you know, we're children of the Enlightenment. You expect to see things getting better, but it, in many things, we've not got very much dramatically better. And I say that, you know, like I'm standing here, I came by a plane, I have my own bank account. There's a lot of ways in which we've progressed enormously, and we must thank our mothers and our grandmothers and our foremothers for their work in that. But we ourselves, as women today, we've got to keep going at it. And as soon as the Me Too campaign announced so many victories in terms of women coming together, 
I predicted that there would be a pushback, and I think we're in the middle of the pushback now. Well, I think we're at the start of the pushback now, and we've just got to maintain our sisterly support for each other. That's the only thing we have. So, one last question. Yes. Uh, when you started out early on, and... Very early on. <laughs> <laughs> so early on. What I'm wondering about is, what sort of barriers did you come up against as far as being an author about historical fiction and women, and how did you handle those struggles with publishers, agents, the male population in general? <laughs> <laughs> um, no, my story is a really irritating Cinderella story. So it really goes against, um, you know, my feminism is deep and powerful, but it comes probably more from my upbringing. Uh, my mother was a widow, and uh, she brought up my sister and me uh, in fairly difficult circumstances, and she always found it hard. And she used to say to me, it's a man's world. And that was true then, and it's probably still true now. In terms of my professional career, I've just had a breeze. I've been really, really lucky. So I wrote my first novel, Wideacre, after I'd been writing, studying my PhD, as I told you. And I sent it to uh, a couple of agents. And one of them sent it back and said she liked the sound of it and would I work on it. And I was moving house, and I was a bit feckless, and I didn't get on with it. But then when I finally unpacked the box that I'd put a letter in, I then went back to writing it, and that, in the end, was Wideacre, a novel which was auctioned in England to five of the top English publishers, and auctioned in the States to four top publishers, and published worldwide and was a number one in England. So it, it's, I am the only person I know even now who sold their first novel to that level of success. It was remarkable. The reason for it was partly uh, Modesty forbids, of course it was fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, obviously. But also, it was at a time when people were just starting to write the novel form, which was rather grossly called sex and shopping novels. And there was a belief that you could have an assertive female heroine who had an active sex life, and that didn't make her the bad woman. She could be the heroine and she could still be a uh, badass. <laughs> <laughs> So that my first novel, Why Dacre, was that. It, she was an 18th century heroine, but she was certainly, uh, in that sense, a very modern vision of what a woman could be. And the publishers worldwide knew that they wanted something to regenerate historical fiction. And in a sense, the reason I was so easily, I was pushing at an open door, because everybody knew they wanted something which would bring historical fiction into the modern world with modern characteristics and uh, with exciting stories in which women were agents of their own story as opposed to the prize at the end. So I was very, very lucky in terms of sexism along the way. Of course, everybody's always told me that I write for women. I don't, I just write, literally, I just write novels and whoever buys it what suits themselves. And um, I suppose there's always been, you know, if you're a woman writer, there is always a sense that you are um, less intellectually rigorous and less complex than male writers. And there's, in a sense, nothing you can do about that except going on writing as well as you can and every now and then standing up for yourself and saying, I think it's, I think it's okay, I think it's good enough. I think it's as good as any man could do. So. You know, as we would say in England, shove it. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so, on that elegant note, thank you very, very much. It's been lovely talking to you, and uh, I'll see you outside. Thank you.